Hi, everyone. My name is Kotesu. And uh, what I'm about to present to you is based off of a paper that was um, co-written by myself, Dr. Maria Bellringer and Dr. Jason Landon, two wonderful people who you've probably already met um, from the Gambling and Addictions Research Center. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Cool. Um, just making sure. So um, I just want to make a slight correction before I, be uh, I begin. And uh, it's part of the title. It says an exploratory analysis of Pacific people's thoughts on community and commercial gambling. I actually want to change that and say it should be a bit broader than that. It should actually be an exploratory analysis of uh, just the relationship between Pacific people and gambling. It's just a bit broader. And uh, as you might have already guessed from the title, um, God, Money, and Family, when we looked at the relationship between Pacific people and family, I mean, and gambling, um, God, Money, and Family were definitely very important and indispensable to understanding the relationship between this ethnic group and um, gambling. Okay, so I'll just give you an overview. First, I'm going to describe to you why Pacific people's gambling patterns are interesting to begin with, what about them seems uh, almost paradoxical. Um, and then I'll describe to you what about our study actually is able to well, il illuminate um, some of the questions that come out of these patterns. And thirdly, what our results were. And uh, I don't want to disappoint any of you, but this is a qualitative research, and the nature of this kind of research is that there's no definitive answer. Um, it's just kind of illuminating and lighting the way to further research. Um, and fourthly, I'll kind of give you some of my own interpretation um, of the data and how I think it might fit together. I do uh, acknowledge the fact that a lot of you aren't from New Zealand, and consequently, you might not be too familiar with who Pacific people are. Um, Pacific people are from the Pacific, and when I say Pacific people, I'm not referring to one ethnic group. It's actually a group of ethnicities, um, and they all have their own distinct cultures and backgrounds. Um, but because of migration patterns and the cross-pollination between cultures in the Pacific, there's actually a lot of cultural similarity between these ethnicities. Um, I don't think I'm doing Pacific people a disservice by um, saying that there are these similarities, and it's, uh, yeah, I can refer to them as Pacific people <coughs> collectively. Um, just some important facts about Pacific people. In New Zealand, they make up 7% of the population um, collectively as a group. And uh, one thing, two things that characterize the population is that they have relatively large families and um, a relatively young population. So an average of three births per woman, um, and that's a good 30% than most other ethnicities in this country, and also a median age of 21 years old. And just to give you a point of comparison, Europeans in this country have a median age of 41 years old, which is quite a bit of a difference. 38% um, of Pacific people are below the ages of uh, 15. Um, that's a snapshot of my family, or at least a very small fraction of my family. Um, in Pacific Island culture, at least with my own experience, um, there's a very extended family structure, an interconnected um, extended family structure, um, as opposed to maybe the atomic family structure that um, is more common in uh, Western cultures. And as you can see, there's a lot of babies and children, very young population. So I'll start talking about what we're here to talk about, which is gambling. Um, if you look at the statistics about Pacific people, the first thing that will strike you is that they have a lower overall prevalence of gambling rates. I mean, they gamble less overall than other ethnicities. Um, up here, this Ministry of Health report from 2012 reports a 10% difference between Pacific people and the general population. This is a finding that's been replicated um, by a number of other studies. So that just in itself, well, that's not very interesting. I mean, that's um, not, and not much of a problem either. However, um, when we look more into it, we actually see that Pacific people have a higher likelihood to develop problem gambling behavior. Um, as you can see, the same Ministry of Health report from 2012, uh, you can see there the likelihood to engage in problem gambling from Pacific people is 7.8%, and that's quite a bit more than the other ethnicities there, especially if you compare Pacific people, 7.8, compared to uh, Europeans, <coughs> 2.4. And you might remember earlier that I said Pacific people make up 7% of the population, right? They make up 21.1% of the problem gambling population and 16.2% of the moderate risk gamblers in this country, uh, according to relatively recent estimates. So that's something interesting. Why is that? Pacific people gamble less overall, but they have a higher likelihood to engage in problem gambling. Why? Now, when I first saw this, um, I thought, well, okay, one easy way to explain this would be socioeconomic status. Um, 
yeah, uh, Pacific people actually have a lower median income than a lot of other ethnicities, and you can attribute a lot of things to this, and that is significant when looking at certain things. Um, <coughs> but the fact of the matter is, is, is that the research has actually looked at this pattern and controlled for socio socioeconomic status and still found that Pacific people still have this higher likelihood to engage in problem gambling. So socioeconomic status does not account for all of uh, what we see with Pacific people in terms of their gambling uh, behavior, their problem gambling behavior. So that's when our study comes in. <coughs> um, it's, a, like I said, a qualitative design. Um, and the question is, just looking at this, uh, the relationship between Pacific people and gambling, and with a bit of an emphasis on culture. Because if we don't have socioeconomic status to explain the, um, the higher um, likelihood for Pacific people to engage in problem gambling, well then what else is there to explain it? Um, other than culture, I mean culture would definitely be something obvious to look at. So qualitative design, we recruited 97 participants from South Auckland, um, all Pacifica, all, all Pacific people. Um, we used semi-structured interviews, we divided them into 12 focus groups, um, and in those focus groups we, um, they underwent semi-structured interviews. So they were just asked a number of questions, um, the questions roughly would be, uh, what are your conceptions of gambling? Um, what are some positive aspects of gambling? What are some negative aspects of gambling? And what are some culturally specific factors um, with gambling? And they were allowed to talk with, uh, amongst themselves and also with the interviewer. <coughs> so those interviews were done. Some of them were actually done in uh, Pacific Island language, Samoan, um, and then transcribed into English um, for an analysis. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with qualitative analysis, but I use a somatic analysis when I analyze it. And uh, generally speaking, somatic analysis is probably one of the more bare bones methods of our qualitative analysis, at least from my understanding. So it's basically just going through the data, reading all the transcripts, rereading the transcripts, rereading the transcripts, and so on and so forth, and then finding patterns in them and identifying them, um, and then categorizing them and then organizing them. So what I'm about to show you in terms of my results are actually themes that were found in the data um, that were fairly consistent and seemed pertinent or germane to the uh, research question. So here's one participant that encapsulates this one thing. It's that the conception of gambling for Pacific people, at least from um, our participants, unsurprisingly, I suppose, or I don't know, um, but when they were asked about what their conceptions of gambling were, they were they showed kind of shock and surprise at the idea that things like lotto and uh, raffles were um, forms of gambling. And I don't know what kind of implications that might have for the prevalence rate that we saw earlier, um, but I just thought that was mildly interesting. But wh what I really should talk about um, is this um, idea of community and commercial gambling. And these are two um, terms that I coined myself, and what they refer to is when I looked at the transcripts, um, Pacific people, the, the, the participants, they talked about two different categories of gambling. And these conversations ran in parallel, but were, were very distinct and different. So they talked about these two kinds of gambling, um, but one kind wasn't considered gambling. Um, I'll, I'll explain it a bit more. So um, community gambling, <coughs> as the participants talk about it, are uh, actually um, forms of gambling that happen obviously in a community, community setting, and they're usually done for fundraising purposes. Um, and usually done for a collective goal, like how about we go and fund someone's funeral or fund a family reunion. And whereas commercial gambling is um, kind of what you would, might imagine it to be, it's done in commercial venues, not for a collective goal, um, and there was a largely a, a negative connotation, um, as we heard earlier actually, um, uh, similar to what um, was said earlier about how people have a negative connotation towards this kind of commercial gambling. So for example, horse betting or um, gaming in a casino. So here's an example that I think encapsulates um, a lot of the attitude towards um, community gambling. Talking about raffle tickets, this Tongan male non-gambler um, non says, uh, raffle tickets, I've done it, but it's for family purposes, like family reunions, and I didn't see it as gambling. So when people, when participants talked about this kind of community gambling, it was at completely separate um, from what they talked about as commercial gambling. And here's another quote that actually encapsulates, um, in my opinion, the, um, the attitude given by participants to commercial gambling. And that is, this person says, 
personally thought that gambling is got to do with money, addicted to money, obsessed with money. So she really just expressing that negative connotation that comes with commercial gambling. So I'm just going to flesh out community gambling just a bit more. Um, like I said, it's gambling in non-commercial settings. And it's really largely linked to church. Um, in fact, when participants talk about this kind of community gambling where they um, crowdfund something, they help fund something through um, a gambling activity such as bingo, um, it was almost always done in church when they talked about which venue it, was, it took place in. And that's not really surprising. Um, amongst the ethnic groups in New Zealand, Pacific Islanders um, tend to be one of the more religious groups of ethnicities, definitely. Um, and that was shown in our sample. 89 out of 97 of, of our participants describe themselves as religious. And just to reiterate that once more, community gambling for fundraising. So not just family reunions like we saw before, but also other things, um, additions to the church, for example. And what we also saw when the churches talked about um, community gambling was almost kind of a contradiction in terms of how um, there was an, a large negative push or at least uh, a leaning towards the rejection of gambling as something um, legitimate or something that should be done. So they're leaning towards that, but on the other hand, they can turn around and say, um, we're actually going to have a fundraising activity in our church, um, and it's going to be, you know, technically a form of gambling. Um, so here's just another quote to encapsulate that. It says, uh, this Psalm 1 female gambler says, um, there's no loss in laughter, basically. And that's this concept that it's win-win. And that's not very hard to understand. So, you know, if you're contributing to a collective goal, such as a family reunion or the funding of that, um, if you put money in and you lose it, well, you're not really losing it. You're still contributing. Um, and this is, with commercial gambling, this is where it gets interesting for me. Um, so, like I said before, when participants talk about commercial um, gambling, they're not done for a collective goal, um, not done for the family. <coughs> they talk about commercial gambling as negative, quite negative. Um, but on top of that, there were also these other themes. So you see below there, easy money and church and family. Um, easy money is the idea that I'm sure isn't specific to Pacific people, that um, you know, gambling is an easy way to obtain money quickly um, and a significant sum of money quickly. But church and family, um, well, when participants talk about church and family, they actually talk about um, these, this idea of church and family financial obligation. So I'm Samoan myself, I'm half Samoan, and in Samoan culture, there's this concept, um, which I can't claim to know completely well, but it's this concept of fai lai lave. And let me just give you an example, example for that. Um, I have a second cousin. He's in Wellington. He's going to get married. I get together with my uncles and aunties and my mother. We get together like two grand, and we send it over. And that's not, um, it's not asked of us explicitly. It's actually something that's just an obligation. It's an unwritten rule in, in Samoan culture, at least from what I've seen. And with the church financial obligations, that's fairly obvious, making offerings to the church and helping fund the church. So easy money, not a hard concept to understand. <coughs> this Tongan female gambler says, uh, I think before I wasn't stressed because I was raised to drop a sweat until someone said, there's another option. Um, you don't have to sweat so much. You can just click your fingers. And obviously, that's referring to the easy way to obtain money through gambling. Um, but moving on to these, uh, this idea of familial and church gift giving. Gift giving is an important component of family life for Pacific people. And I can corroborate that with my own personal experience with it. Um, and like I said, familial gift giving, when, partici when participants talked about it, they actually talked about it as, um, in some cases, actually as an indirect motivator for gambling, for commercial gambling. They say, okay, well, um, I have financial woes because um, of uh, familial obligations, um, and I'm going to go and gamble to meet those obligations. And the same comes in church. Um, church gift giving can come in a number of forms. Uh, one obvious one would be giving offerings in church. They pass the plate around. Um, and another one would be that participants mentioned was tithing. That's 10% of your income given to the church. And then another one would, um, would be actually participating in um, church fundraisers. So um, this participant really sums it up nicely. Um, and we saw a lot of comments like this. And he says that the main reason why some parents gamble is to get that extra income because we have a lot of fa'alavalave like cultural obligations. 
and there's a general consensus amongst the focus groups um, to that. So I think there's a common, um, common experience and some Pacific Islanders, at least based on what I've seen from this, um, some Pacific Islanders actually um, meet these cultural obligations um, by gambling. And this is an interesting one. This is like maybe one of two comments I mentioned this, um, but this participant, she's talking about crawling. And crawling is actually um, quick fundraisers that happen in really quick succession. Um, so for example, imagine like three fundraisers in one week and you're obligated to go to all of them and spend money at all of them. That's a financial burden. And um, uh, she actually said later on that that actually has some links or she posits a link between that and commercial gambling. And just one thing that I didn't mention earlier, um, but that hardship motivates gamblers. And I'm, I'm sure this, isn't, this is hardly specific for Pacific people. Um, first quote reads, struggling on the benefit, the benefit being the New Zealand form of welfare. Um, not enough money on the benefit, turn to gambling, it's just around the corner. And it's just around the corner is underlined because one thing I haven't had time to talk about, but which is very important to understanding the relationship between Pacific people and gambling is accessibility. Because there's quite a few gambling venues in South Auckland, um, but I'm not really equipped to talk about that right now. <coughs> and the second quote reads, my family and my parents, they do lotto every single week, um, but I don't think it's an addiction because money is tight in our family. So there was quite a theme. People talked a lot about how there was hardship and how they were meeting um, their financial obligations or their debts or whatever with gambling. And you can see how that actually um, is related to these ideas. So, you know, a lack of money leads to gambling. But what's interesting for the Pacific people is that the lack of money can come from certain things that might not be found in other ethnic groups, um, like this idea of fa la 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 that's the Samoan. So this diagram here kind of gives you an indication um, <coughs> of how it all might fit together. So on the left, we have commercial gambling behavior. And from what I saw, it's quick financial demands, fi family financial demands, such as gift giving. Um, that leads to a need for money that interacts with this idea that uh, gambling uh, is an easy way to um, gain money and that leads to commercial gambling behavior which uh, with community gambling behavior it actually starts off with uh, church participation community participation you're part of the group um, and then you feel obligated to donate when they have these fundraising um, behavior I mean fundraising events and there's also um, up there what says a desire to socialize and that was another thing that I wasn't able to cover here. Um, but desire to socialize was one motivator for Pacific people to engage in um, community gambling. So I'm going to end with some speculation on um, where we can proceed from here. Um, like I said, there's no definitive answers that come from this. What it does is merely just give us an idea, a starting point from which to understand the relationship between this ethnic group and gambling. And. Uh, one thing that I can think of is, well, one thing that, that I thought of speculating on this is that religion um, is a factor, and not just religion generally, I mean denomination of religion. Um, Berlin and Hip in 2011, they come up, came up with this idea of social capital. Um, so of course you have regular capital, which is monetary. Um, social capital is something that's less definite. Um, and they actually separated that into bonding and bridging. And when they separated it into bonding and bridging, they associated it with different kinds of Christian denominations. Um, I hope that's kind of easy to follow. Um, so bonding for them is actually when you have a close-knit group and there's not much interaction with other groups. And they saw um, conservative de denominations as examples of bonding. And then when you have bridging, you actually have a close-knit group that does have these connections with other groups. And um, they associated liberal, liberal um, denominations with bridging. And what they found was that um, in a number of problem behaviors, them and other people that have used this framework, they found that um, problem behaviors such as gambling or alcoholism actually um, correlates with the amount of bonding as measured by denomination in a community. And they also found that bridging, when you see more bridging, you see less of these problem behaviors. Um, so what I would like to see is actually a look at the concentration of certain denominations in the Pacific community. Um, um, to help us understand the relationship just based on the amount of emphasis participants put on um, regarding the relationship between the religion um, and gambling. And finally, I'd actually like to see some research on finance and Pacific culture. So what exactly might it be about fa la or gift giving that might have an impact on gambling? 
Um, it could be that it's the rapid and stu sudden um, onslaught of, of financial obligations for Pacific people that might um, perhaps have some influence on the gambling behavior or how they approach gambling. Um, I really hope that by looking at this presentation today, you've actually maybe kind of understood the process or part of what it, uh, what it comes with to understand the relationship between a minority ethnic group and gambling. And hopefully you might be able to make that applicable in your own uh, respective countries. Um, I just want to say thanks for watching and special thanks to the Ministry of Health for funding this project and the participants for graciously providing their um, time and energy. Thank you.